So welcome everybody coming out on this very cold night. Not quite as bad as it looked this morning, which is a little terrifying. Um, yeah, welcome so much to the uh, Reproductive Sociology Annual Lecture, and it's great to see you all here in the Pitt Building. I'm Sarah Franklin, I'm the director of the Reproductive Sociology Research Group, ReproSoc, here at Cambridge as well as the chair of this event tonight. Uh, and before I introduce our speaker, I just want to celebrate the fact that Reprosoc is 10 years old this autumn, no longer a toddler, <laughs> um, having been launched in October 2012. Um, it's also something to celebrate uh, that over the past decade, Cambridge has really become the world leading center for the study of reproduction, or, or what have actually come to be known as reproductive studies. Um, and in addition to being birthplace of reproductive biology, in the early 20th century, the discovery of DNA, mid-century, and the development of human IVF in the 1970s, Cambridge is home to pioneering work in the anthropology of reproduction, reproductive biomedicine, sociology of reproduction, the history of reproduction, the history of the reproductive sciences, uh, reproduction in the law, um, reproductive justice, um, changing forms of parenting, um, and the social psychology of reproduction, and maternal health. Uh, the Cambridge Interdisciplinary Research Forum, um, Reproductive Research Forum, which ran for more than a decade, here at Cambridge from, from 2005 to 2016, I think, you'll know. Um, brought together reproductive scholars working across disciplines as diverse as classics, physics, literature, philosophy, and medicine. And this tradition of interdisciplinary reproductive research has continued today in the newly established Strategic Research Initiative in Reproduction, which is the only such initiative anywhere in the world, building bridges in reproductive studies that are not only interdisciplinary and cross school, but extend across the entire university. Um, and this is timely, because what we're seeing in the field of reproduction is enormous change not only in the sciences, but in politics, ethics, economics, the environment, as our recent study of fertility change worldwide in Reprosoc has shown, concerns about reproduction are moving center stage, not only in scholarly research, but in social and cultural life. The law is, of course, an excellent example of how this is happening. We're consequently very fortunate to be hosting such a distinguished speaker today, for there really is no other scholar as knowledgeable or insightful about reproduction in the law than Professor Emily Jackson. Her book, Regulating Reproduction, which I have here, I can pass it around, um, is, um, is, is, is a landmark publication that set the bar very high for legal scholarship in this field when it was first published in 2001. And Professor Jackson has remained at the forefront of this field ever since. She became a member of the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority in 2003 and its deputy chair in 2008, serving until 2012. Following her Oxford Law degree, Emily lectured at several universities, including Cambridge, and was appointed to her first chair at Queen Mary in 2004. She was shortly afterwards appointed to a professorship at the L in law at the LSE um, in 2007, and Emily became the head of LSE law in 2012. She's a member of numerous high-level ethics committees for the Medical Research Council, the RCOG, the Department of Health, and a member of the Judicial Appointments Commission, which she joined in 2014. In 2016, Professor Jackson was elected a fellow of the British Academy and in 2017 awarded an OBE for services to higher education. Rereading 
MLA's highly acclaimed early monograph on regulating reproduction also reminds us that one of the great distinctions of her work is not only its deep and abiding commitment to human rights and reproductive freedom, but its profoundly feminist understanding of reproduction as fundamental to the law and social justice. This is a beautifully written book. The footnotes alone are a masterclass in scholarly nuance and close reading. Whenever I read Emily's work, I'm reminded of what we might call the Jacksonian triple lock. <laughs> There's the unmistakable authority of her command of case law and legal precedent, and there's the delight in her intellectual agility, but there's always also a steady note of compassion and care that is never far from the surface. A key argument of this book from its outset is that the law should not only protect but promote the protection of individual rights, freedoms, and entitlements. And this could not be a more timely message in the context of the current political climate surrounding reproductive rights worldwide. Another argument um, is that the insights gained from this often neglected area of law are critical to the social fabric, to social justice, and to the role of law more widely. In this respect, Emily's work closely parallels both that of Mary Warnock and Helena Kennedy in bringing law, ethics, and social justice not only more clearly into view, but, more and, but making them more analytically central to good governance, fairness, and effective policy. In this way, I have always thought of Emily very much as a sociologist. <laughs> and it is a true pleasure to welcome her tonight for a lecture that will look back at 20 years of regulating reproduction. Emily has also been a close friend and colleague for many years, and I'm grateful not only for her inspiring scholarship, her compassion, and her humor, but also her support on innumerable occasions. I hope you'll join me in welcoming our very distinguished speaker tonight, Professor Emily Jackson. Thanks, Sarah. That was an unbelievably generous introduction. I'm, um, I'm, I'm almost lost for words, but that would be a bit inconvenient. <laughs> I, will, I will try to tell. Um, it's a huge honour to be here, and I'm so grateful to you all for coming out on a wet, um, wet, um, cold evening in November. Okay, so as Sarah said, 21 years ago I published a, a book um, which I'd started writing. My initial plan had been to write a quasi-textbook to just set out really clearly what's the law and regulation that applies to different aspects of reproduction. So that's my plan at the beginning. It ended up being something rather different. At some point in the, in the writing this, it turned into a rant about <laughs> reproductive autonomy. And I'll say a bit more about when I think I made the swerve from textbook to rant in a bit. Um, but I recently reread Sarah's marvellous uh, 1997 book, Embodied Progress, uh, which made a huge difference to me when I was um, working on this. So the experience of revisiting that book um, made me think it might be interesting to go back and think about whether since 2001, in the last 21 years, has there been progress? Um, have things got better? Um, have there been, in other cases, perhaps the opposite of progress and things have actually got worse? Um, and are there perhaps some different or unanticipated new issues that have arisen? So I'm just going to pick up a few themes from the book and I'm going to think about how things have changed. Um, and I want to start with abortion, because I think it's been quite an interesting complete reversal since 2001. So in 2001, mm -hmm. abortion was illegal in the Republic of Ireland. The Eighth Amendment to the Constitution recognised an equal right to life of the pregnant woman um, and the unborn, which meant in practice that it was only possible to get an abortion if the woman's life was at risk. And even then, uh, there were instances when it, 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 was, it was difficult or impossible for women. Whereas at that time in um, the United States, abortion was a constitutionally protected right, albeit obviously with some restrictions since 2003. Uh, and this has been completely changed around. So um, the Irish constitution can be changed, which um, is in many ways a very progressive thing to be able to change a constitution. Um, so the repeal of the eighth campaign and referendum led to a change in the law so that abortion is now lawful in the Republic of Ireland. There are restrictions um, and it's, um, it's certainly true that access is not easy 
for some women in the Republic of Ireland. There's some parts of, of Ireland where access is difficult, and particularly for women in rural areas, it can be, it's not straightforward necessarily to get an abortion. But nonetheless, it's lawful. Whereas in the United States, as, as we're all very familiar with, Dobson Jackson earlier this year overturned Roe versus Wade. And I wanted to say a little bit about um, <coughs> Dobbs' decision. I wanted to pull out three things that I think are interesting about it. The first is that it has its roots in um, a, a way of making decisions which is often described as originalism. And this is the idea that if a right isn't actually set down in the Constitution in explicit terms, it can be recognised only if it's part of the deeply rooted traditions of the US. And what that means is that rights is, are effectively frozen in time. So the 14th Amendment, right to privacy, on which Roe was based, was enacted in 1868. Um, I don't think we could look back in 1868 as some kind of pinnacle of, um, of rights recognition because it was 51 years before women could vote. It was 96 years before the Civil Rights Act um, and segregation. So this idea that there's no effective way to update rights is kind of the opposite of progressive. It's, it's what you might call anti-progressive. I think the other thing that's really interesting, though, about originalism is it's often described as a, as a principle of judicial restraint, that rather than judges making law and meddling, rights are derived neutrally from the text of the Constitution. So it's often thought of as judges holding back. Um, but in, in this case, it's the opposite of, of judicial restraint. I think you could see this as a value-laden, value-heavy, deeply political project um, that's um, been being pursued in the United States since, well, for at least 40 years. You can see from the Republican Party platform in 1980, just seven years after Roe, was working for the appointment of judges who might be prepared to overturn Roe. So it's, it's, it's very much political. I also wanted to say something about the Dobbs' judgment use of precedent. I'm not going to read what's on the, on the slide, but this is kind of extraordinary. This is directly from Justice Samuel Alito's uh, opinion of the court. And these are sources of English common law. Um, but they're very, very old. They're not English law now. And all of them um, date from before the United States existed. So it's slightly odd in terms of precedence to say, let's look back at Henry de Bracton's 13th century <laughs> treaties to find out what we ought to be doing about abortion in the United States in 2022. But, so the use of precedent here is really odd. But despite looking back to sources of the common law of England, Roe itself is not treated as an important precedent. And I think this is a real problem um, in, in the judgment. Because I think you could argue, um, I think plausibly, that if the abortion has been a constitutionally protected right for 50 years, it's become deeply rooted. Um, one of the reasons why we need to respect precedent, and I think the precedent of Rome um, is an important one, is because people rely on the law being a certain way. They organise their lives in a certain way. And so precedent's important because of those sorts of reliance interests. And the judgment in Dobbs um, says that women don't have reliance interests in Roe because abortion decision making is generally unplanned and therefore you can't be relying on abortion's legality. Lucy, there's a seat at the front if you want to kind of sit down. Sorry, I don't want you standing. Yeah. So, um, so this idea that, that because abortion decision making is something that's unplanned, women don't rely on the existence of safe legal abortion. When I read that, I just thought, well, that's just mad. Have they actually asked a woman about this? Because I think for generations of women, I think, have organised their lives on the assumption that if contraception fails, there's a backstop in safe legal abortion. So the idea that there aren't reliance interests strikes me as, as absurd. But also, as well as the fact that Roe as a precedent is not taken, I think, seriously enough, there's also um, uh, an important point about what the job of a Supreme Court is. It's not just to overrule itself whenever it feels like it. Certainly in the UK Supreme Court, although it can overrule itself, 
Generally, it will only do that if there's something new that needs to be taken into account, or something that's re newly recognised that we need to, um, we need, that means that the law needs to change, not just because people don't like the previous judgment. The third thing that I think is really interesting in the Dobbs judgment is its insularity, um, which is unusual. It's, it's, if you read it, it's apart from the references to English common law from centuries ago, it's just as though abortion is, uh, uh, is about constitutional law. It doesn't look beyond that. And there are Supreme Court judgments. This is a death penalty one from a few years ago which suggests that it's, it's, the Supreme Court can look beyond um, its own jurisprudence. It can look at, other, um, at what goes on in other countries and in international law, but not in this judgment. So if you do look beyond US constitutional theory at some of the evidence, I think you can see really clearly from global uh, reviews of abortion law, the evidence is incredibly compelling that rates of abortion are higher in countries with restrictive abortion laws than they are in countries with liberal abortion laws. So having restrictive abortion laws in a global sense is not associated with fewer abortions. It's associated with more abortions, but obviously also more unsafe abortions. There's also um, evidence, which I think is really um, chilling, actually, about um, the US global gag rule. Um, this is uh, a rule that stops the US aid budget being spent on reproductive care that might be used um, to fund abortion. And the global gag rule is this pendulum that swings depending on whether there's a Republican or a Democrat in the White House. As soon as a Republican president is elected, he, he enacts the global gag rule, aid cannot be spent on reproductive care that might involve abortion. And as soon as the Democrat um, comes into the White House, he rescinds this and reproductive care uh, worldwide could be funded. And the group of economists traced um, global maternal mortality and found that it is higher when there's a Republican in the White House than when a Democrat is. So really chilling evidence that, um, that this has a uh, real life impact. And just the final, raising the Supreme Court's eye above the parapet here that I think is interesting is that increasingly the United Nations recognises that denying women access to abortion isn't just a privacy violation, as it was um, said to be in Rome, but beyond that it amounts to discrimination, um, cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment, and even gender-based violence. So, all in all, it won't surprise you to, to learn that I think Dobbs is a truly terrible um, decision. I think it's terrible in legal terms, it's terrible in its impact. On women. But it's often said about the Dobbs decision is, well, there's reasonable disagreement in society about abortion. And in the US, 40% uh, of, of the population is pro-life, and so there is some reasonable disagreement there. But actually, I'm not sure that that's quite right in the sense that the number of people in the US who would deny a woman abortion if her life was at risk or if she's a child who's pregnant as a result of rape or incest, is actually tiny, and yet that is what Roe facilitates, sorry, Dobbs facilitates. Um, the only possible silver lining to this, I think, is if, if the decision persuaded more people to vote in the midterm elections, and there seems to possibly be some evidence that it did, that it's a very small silver lining, um, because it's uh, truly dreadful. Okay, very briefly, I want to say a couple of things about childbirth. Because um, one of the things I remember worrying about when I was um, when I was writing the book originally was the fact that it seemed to be quite easy to overrule women's decision making during childbirth by finding them to lack capacity because of the stress and pain of labour. So women's decision making could be overruled um, relatively easily by saying, "Well, actually, this woman doesn't have capacity. We can." Um, we can intervene in a way that she doesn't want us to. And I'm not sure this is progress because there's been some recent um, developments in the Court of Protection which are actually really worrying as well, which is the use of anticipatory declarations for women who have capacity. Um, and these are anticipatory declarations that if she loses capacity, a caesarean section can be carried out in her best interests because it would be in her best interests to give birth to a healthy fetus. 
So I think this is quite a worrying development because there's no need for an anticipatory declaration. If somebody lacks capacity, at that point you can make a decision for them. Um, and we don't do this in other contexts in relation to medical decisions. So the worry here is that women who have previously had mental health issues but currently have capacity are perhaps particularly at risk of having this anticipatory declaration made which then might hang over them so that they know that if um, there's a doubt about their capacity their decision is going to be um, overridden. Um, so one thing that I think has changed in relation to childbirth is the naming of um, mistreatment of women, ignoring women, disrespecting women during childbirth. The renaming of this as obstetric violence. Um, this isn't an entirely new term. It's been traced back to um, a letter to the Lancet in 1827 by a doctor who was worried about forcible interference in birth and he used the term violence to describe it. But now it has global recognition, for example by the UN, um, and legal recognition in some South American countries. So I think the harm of mistreating women during childbirth is, is obviously um, something that in order to do anything about it, you have to, to name it, and I think recognizing it as a very serious harm is a step towards change. Another, um, example of naming and acknowledging um, in relation to childbirth is the absolutely appalling and shocking evidence from a report earlier this year on black women's experiences of maternity care that there are extraordinary racial inequalities in women's experience of both maternity care and, and childbirth. The statistic, which is just so profoundly shocking, is black women are four times more likely to die during pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum. So that's something that I think in 2001, just there wasn't any sense that we needed to unpick racism in maternity services. And it's not a good thing that it's there, but it's certainly a good thing that it's being um, named. And the, the reasons for this um, appear to be discrimination, racist attitudes, racist assumptions. Um, so naming it doesn't solve it, but it's certainly um, important. The other uh, set of inequalities that I think are just, just starting to be recognised are in relation to fertility treatment, where the HFEA produced a report a few years ago, for the first time, it had never done this sort of analysis before, which demonstrated that outcomes are worse for, for women from minoritised groups. So there's obviously it's incredibly important to recognise that the experience of fertility treatment intersects with disadvantage in all sorts of ways. Um, and it's really important that the regulatory body, body is at least now measuring and acknowledging this. Obviously, the next step is doing something about it to change, to change those um, figures. I want to come on now to um, the part of the regulation of um, fertility treatment that is, I think, I think I can trace this as the is the point in which this book turned into a rant. Because I felt completely enraged by this bit of the statute in 2001. I'm still a little bit enraged, but not as much so as I was. But I was, in 2001, completely enraged by this. And it did, I think, this was the point at which I started thinking, no more neutral textbook. I'm going to, I'm going to be a bit, more, um, a bit more forceful. So, so what's wrong with this? It, it looks quite innocuous at, at first sight. And I've put the two versions of it um, here. One's the original one uh, from the 1990 Act. I can't provide treatment services to a woman unless you've taken account of the child's welfare, in, inverted sorry, in parentheses, including the need of that child for a father. It was amended in 2008 to take out the need for a father and replace it with supportive um, parenting. So, what's wrong with this? Well, multiple things are wrong with it. First thing that's wrong with this is that it's, it's just illogical. Um, the reason I think it's illogical is that what you're telling a clinician to do is to say, make a decision on whether to bring a child into the world upon the consideration of that child's welfare. But it's saying to the clinician, you have to think about a child who will be born, and decide whether or not they should exist based on assessment of that welfare, their welfare. And of course, for the vast majority of children, your welfare is served by existing. It would be hard 
not impossible, but very hard to say, I'm going to take into account this child's welfare and decide it's better if they, they were never born. As I say, I think there probably are examples where that would be the case. For example, when you hear those awful stories of children who've been tortured and killed by um, people who are supposed to be caring for them, I think plausibly then you could say it might be better for that child if it hadn't had its horribly short and painful life, but not for most children. So you're asking clinicians to do something that actually doesn't really make any sense. So that was the first thing that um, I think annoyed me about this. The second thing is, obviously, in the original version, this is discriminatory. It's horribly discriminatory against women without male partners. Um, the reason for this is that in 1990, this was, most of you are too young, but for those of us who, who aren't too young, this was the time of the, um, the Thatcher government with traditional family values, and, um, and, and it was very much part of the, the, the zeitgeist that we had to be worried about absent fathers and things like that. But, so anyway, the, 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 in, when the Act was being debated in 1990, there was an amendment which would have confined all fertility treatment to married couples, which at that time was men and women only. And that amendment, which would have meant no single women, no female same-sex couples, no unmarried couples, uh, heterosexual couples, that amendment lost by one vote. So there was a very great amount of support in Parliament for the idea that fertility treatment was for husbands and wives. And this is from the then Lord Chancellor in the debates over the Act. Um, and to 2022 eyes, this looks really shocking. This is the idea that um, what, what should be happening in these cases is women without men, they might encounter a responsible doctor who will dissuade them from <laughs> wanting to have a child once they fully consider the implications of doing so without a man. Um, so, as I say, shocking um, to today, but that was very much what um, things were like in, in 1990. So also enraging when I um, was, was working on this in late 1990s, early 2000s, was the HFEA code of practice at the time, which told clinicians how to apply the welfare clause. And clinics were basically, they weren't being asked to say, would these parents be so awful that this child shouldn't exist? That wasn't the question they were being asked to, to, to consider. The code of practice said, when you think about what's the commitment to having children, if they got a safe, stable and supportive environment, basically, would they be good parents? So clinics would routinely, um, in those days, ask people, how many bedrooms do you have in your house? What arrangements are you planning to make for your child's childcare? And, of course, there's no reason why somebody who's undergoing fertility treatment, they don't pose any greater risk to, to children. So we don't do that to fertile people. So this was entirely opportunistic, this monitoring of whether or not people would be good parents. And, and I think, frankly, um, unfair. So things have certainly got better. Since 2005, the HFEA has recast the welfare of the child assessment that is a statutory requirement as a risk assessment. So the question for clinicians now is not would these people or this person be a good parent, it's is there any evidence that means that this child might be at risk? Is there any reason for concern? So we're not looking, we're not scrutinising people anymore to see if they'd be good parents, we're trying to work out if there's a potential risk of, of harm. Um, and on the need for supportive parenting, this was the change that was made in 2008. The HFEA, again, says all parents should be presumed to be supportive unless there's ev evidence of a risk of harm. The reason why, just as an aside, that it, the need for a father was replaced by the need for supportive parenting was that the government then um, had its, its original plan had been just to delete the bit in parentheses, to delete the need for a father. And the view that the government had taken there is this, that was out of step with equality legislation, with developments in family law. It was um, to have a statutory provision which is inviting people to discriminate against women without male partners was, was the government thought it was straightforward to get rid of that. But of course, they, they reckoned without lobbies in Parliament and in the Daily Mail who thought that the getting rid of the need for a father, you can imagine, it just seems like we're saying fathers don't matter, children don't need fathers. So 
it was a huge outcry about this, and um, in the end, the need for supportive parenting was, was, was the compromise on that. And I think there has been a real change in attitudes, particularly towards female same-sex couples in relation to the welfare clause. So this is a study carried out a few years ago by Ellie Lee, Sally Sheldon and Jan McFarish, where they were talking to people who carry out the welfare of the child um, assessments in clinics. And they found in that research that same-sex <coughs> female couples were seen as ideal and superior. Um, so there was a way in which <laughs> lesbian parenting was, was actually much better for children. And this was, uh, it was, this was partly articulated in terms of the fact that women had thought about this, they thought about carefully about being a child. It was also, I think, to do with the fact that um, the women were, were planning to be open, obviously, with their children about the use of donated sperm. And that was seen by the people working in clinics as a really thing that marked people out as being being really good. In this same study, it was quite interesting that they found that clinics weren't as um, welcoming to single women who were, fa who were sometimes referred to as being a bit odd. Um, so there did seem to be in this study a real bifurcation of female same-sex couples being, um, being ideal, um, single women maybe not so much. There's, there's some seats, at the, there's a seat at the front if you want to sit down, if you don't oh, want to have to perch, please, please do feel free. Um, so, so attitudes have changed, but I think there is still some discrimination. Um, and, and one of the ways in which I think this happens is in the context of shared motherhood arrangements. And these are arrangements where a female same-sex couple decide that they will share motherhood um, so that both mothers can have a biological connection to the child. So <coughs> these are arrangements where um, an egg from one partner is fertilised with donated sperm and the embryo is carried by the other partner. So one of the mothers will be the gestational mother and the other mother is the genetic mother. Um, legally, however, that's not possible. So although in these arrangements you can understand that the women who enter into these arrangements consider they are both the child's mother, they both have a really important connection to the child, Legally, only the gestational mother is a mother, and the genetic mother must be registered on the birth certificate as parent too, which is obviously not what she thinks <laughs> she is. Um, the other thing that's discriminatory here, I think, is she, she has to be screened as if, which is more expensive, as if she were a donor rather than a partner. And that's because the Act really, anachronistically, I think, defines partner-created embryos as embryos created through gametes of a man and a woman. Um, I think for trans patients, um, the this, this situation in terms of discrimination I think is worse. <coughs> so it's not even actually clear that it's lawful for clinics to treat trans men because the Act defines treatment services as services provided for the purposes of assisting women to carry children. So there's some debate about whether or not um, that enables trans men to be um, treated lawfully. Also, if a trans man does receive treatment and give birth, legally he must be um, described as the child's mother. He has to be legally a mother. And this was confirmed a couple of years ago in the McConnell case, where a man who had given birth wanted to be registered as his child's father, uh, failing that as his child's gestational parent. And the law said no, the person who gives birth to a child is the, legally the mother, regardless of whether that person is a man. And it's kind of non sequitur to this judgment that the rights of children include the rights of those who gave birth to them. You don't necessarily have to call that person the mother, but the, the view of the court was every child should have a mother, that's the person who gives birth, um, and so a man can be a mother too. I wanted to um, turn now, staying with IVF, but to talk about commercialisation, obviously not an entirely new thing at all, but I think two things that I think have happened since 2001 is two ways in which you might grow the market for IVF. The first way is, um, so you've got your group of patients who are people who are struggling to conceive. One way of growing the size of the market is to sell each patient more stuff 
to sell them additional treatments, alternative therapies. So you've got your captive group of patients and you sell them more. Another way to grow the market is to try to increase the number of people who have treatment services. And obviously egg freezing is a really good example of that because you can market that to people who are not struggling to conceive, who are fertile and perhaps not even thinking about having children for a while. And you could say for egg freezing, any premenopausal woman who hasn't completed her family is potentially um, a recipient of egg freezing who could be have it marketed to them. And, and on this, I was, I'm was i reminded of a, a quote which really stayed with me when I was doing some work on um, something, a, a book I wrote about the pharmaceutical industry. And it was a quote from the CEO of Merck um, in um, 30, 40 years ago. And he, he was bemoaning the fact that the market for pharmaceutical products was confined to sick people. So this is, this is not great for marketing. I've only got sick people in the market. Too. He said he wanted Merck to be like Wrigley's chewing gum and sell to everybody. And of course, we know that the pharmaceutical companies have been quite successful at thinking of ways to market medicines to people who are actually quite well. So preventative medicines, statins are taken by vast numbers of people who are perfectly well at the moment as some kind of preventative therapy. So selling more stuff to people, increasing your market is obviously important. This, this somebody else still saying this, I think back, if you want to come and sit down, that's totally fine. Okay. Um, so in relation to increasing the number of stuff that you sell to each patient, um, add-on therapies, as they're often called, are not licensable treatments. They're not something you need a license from the HFEA to carry out. Um, so the HFEA's powers are limited to information provision. It doesn't have the power to stop clinics providing them, it could, but it does, and it, it has provided information to patients. Sorry, the text is probably a bit small here. But I think most people think the HFEA's done quite a good job with information provision through what's they describe as a traffic light system. So um, if, if an add-on therapy is amber, what that means is that the evidence is mixed and it shouldn't be recommended for routine use. So that's amber. If it's red, there is no evidence of efficacy. Now, no add-ons are green. All of them are amber, i.e. shouldn't be recommended for routine use, or red, no evidence of efficacy. So I think the HFEA has done quite a good job of, of, of communicating that, but whether it's made any difference is another matter. Because a little bit of Googling of um, clinics' websites suggests that there's no shortage of clinics offering these treatments and making claims for efficacy, such as give your embryo a helping hand with embryo glue. So obviously they're claiming then that embryo glue is going to help you. Uh, as I say, this was just a quick Google on clinics' websites. There's a lot of this out there. So one thing that I think is being recognised as an issue increasingly in the increasingly privatised world of IVF is overselling um, and the dangers that come with that. So recently, the Competition and Markets Authority issued specific guidance on consumer law, both for patients and for clinics, and this is saying things like, you mustn't make unsubstantiated claims about success. Although it seems clear from uh, my previous slide that there's quite a lot of that about. Um, and that you mustn't, another thing that the clinics shouldn't be doing is advertising low headline price rates. So you think egg freezing doesn't sound very expensive. And then you find out the storage costs are going to be um, huge. So. Um, Misleading people um, is, is something clinics shouldn't be doing, though I think there's quite a lot of evidence that they, they are. There's also important that clinics shouldn't hide information. For example, not explaining to women that age will have an impact on egg freezing. So offering egg freezing services to women who might be unlikely to have enough eggs harvested to have a decent chance of success, um, there needs to be uh, more they need to not be telling thing, patients things that are misleading. A slightly different issue, which is something that I, I've become completely um, really interested in in recent years, is around informed consent. And in particular, seeing informed consent not just about the risks of the treatment, but also about the difficulty in stopping IVF. 
uh, and that I think we need to do a lot better, clinics need to do a lot better at helping people to stop IVF. So it's very easy to get people in the clinic door and to get them to consent. But actually, for some patients, uh, it might be important to help them to stop um, treat having treatment. And I think one thing that I'm really, I think is really interesting is it's increasingly common for people to use the language of addiction in relation to IVF. Addiction being maybe the failure to resist an impulse to do something that might be harmful. And one sees this quite frequently in relation to people who are finding it difficult to stop IVF. This is a, an article from some years ago now by somebody who might be familiar to some of you here, Jessica Hepburn, who fortunately has stopped um, the IVF for everyone and is a complete force of nature. She's climbed Everest, she's swum the English Channel, so she's, she's, she's not in this position anymore, but it's a really powerful piece that she wrote about how hard it was for her to make the decision to stop. And, and this gambling metaphors, addiction metaphors, are actually really, really common. Um, often you hear about IVF as a lottery ticket, or egg freezing as a lottery ticket. So I, I think this is quite interesting because if we think about um, addiction, we think about <coughs> gambling addiction, the gambling industry is an industry which is under an unusual duty, sometimes to help clients make less use of its services. So that there's a duty of care to make sure that people are not um, doing things that hurt themselves. Um, and we've all seen on gambling adverts, not sure how effective this is, but things like when the fun stops, stop, as if to say sometimes you need to, to stop doing this. Um, so I think we need to, I think there needs to be more thought to, to how we help people stop. This isn't a new issue. Um, Sarah, um, in 1997, wrote really powerfully about the IVF treadmill and how hard it is to get off, off of that treadmill. And one of the reasons why it's so hard is that people have these little successes along the way. You have eggs are har harvested, they might be successfully fertilised. People might even have had a chemical pregnancy. So somebody whose treatment keeps failing has had successes. And so that makes it harder to stop because you've come close. And so why stop now? Why not keep going? And Sarah also wrote really powerfully about treatment failure not being a reason to think about stopping, but a reason to try something else. There's something we could tweak, something else that we could do. Um, but I think we need to think, I think we need to really, really help women with this because I think our informed consent processes in relation to facility treatment don't do a good enough job of alerting women to the fact that it may, they may in the future find it difficult to stop treatment. So one thing that I've seen um, suggest, as a suggestion, which obviously isn't a binding thing, but to encourage people at the outset to set a number, a maximum number of cycles they would have um, in order, before they give up. So I'm not going to have more than this. Obviously that's not binding, people could have more cycles if they want to, but at least it might give someone pause for thought that at the outset they didn't think they should keep going after however many cycles it is. I think there's also a really interesting and difficult question, and, and I do think this is really hard, about whether it's actually unethical to treat people where the likely success is incredibly low, because the treatment is incredibly unlikely to work or, or even futile. Because the reason why I think this is a really difficult informed consent issue is that a, even if a doctor says, I think this is futile, if that doctor is willing to offer treatment, that communicates a really confusing double message to people. A doctor who's willing to provide treatment is communicating to the patient that they think that this might be likely to work. So whatever they say, even if they say your chance of success is very low, um, it's not clear that that will be easy to understand. And I think failure rates, success rates, are also really complicated here because we can talk about somebody having a 5% chance or a 10% chance of success or, or, or much lower than that. But from the point of view of an individual, those sorts of percentages don't really make sense because from an individual it's binary. You're either going to have a baby or you're not. So people have such a desire for the best case option here that people don't hear 5% and think, I'm not going to go there. They might think 5% and think, well, there's no reason why it, it, it shouldn't be me. So I think we need to think really carefully about communicating about failure. I think when I think clinics are 
are not necessarily very good at doing this. And I think the, th the question of whether or not there might be times where it's actually unethical to offer treatment is something that we need to consider. Obviously, in relation to autonomy, this is hard, because a woman might say, it's my money, it's my body, if I want to do this, it's up to me. But I think doctors do have ethical obligations too. Um, the final thing I just wanted to mention briefly was surrogacy, where uh, I think there have been some important changes. One is that when I was doing the work for the now rather old book, you could only get a parental order following surrogacy if you were a husband and wife. So not if you were an unmarried couple, not if you were a same-sex couple, not if you were a single person. And that's changed. Uh, now parental orders could be granted to two people or to one person. Uh, so the eligibility has been expanded. And I think we can expect some even more permissive um, regulation being proposed in the next few months when the Law Commission announces the results of their final consultation, where they'll set out some recommendations and draft legislation. And one of the things that they proposed in their consultation paper is that in certain circumstances it should be possible for intended parents to be the legal parents from birth if certain criteria are satisfied. Um, the one thing that was really clear in the, um, in the Law Commission's consultation was the importance of listening to surrogates um, and hearing what they say about, um, about how they feel about surrogacy. And one example of this is in relation to what surrogates are called. So in the glossary to the Law Commission proposals, they said they talked to surrogates, surrogates didn't like the term surrogate mother, and so as a result they had chosen to refer to, to um, the woman who gave birth here as surrogate. This isn't without controversy, and there's been actually quite a, a vigorous backlash to the Law Commission's proposals and quite a lot of campaigning organisations who are um, anti-surrogacy. So I think we can expect when the Law Commission do publish their proposals there will be intense criticism. So, finally, um, what I wanted to just say in relation to my uh, whistle-stop looking back at the last 21 years of, uh, of the regulation of reproduction, there's definitely some cause to celebration. I think attitudes towards same-sex Parenthood has changed beyond all recognition. Abortion is uh, lawful in the Republic of Ireland. There's also some reasons to be really quite alarmed. Obviously, um, obviously from my point of view, the Dobbs decision is, is, is a good example of that. And I think there are some newly acknowledged issues which are problematic, issues around racism, um, inequality, um, commercialisation, and I'd like to suggest informed consent. So, there are no guarantees of progress. Um, I think the idea that we're on some um, narrative arc of progress in which society becomes more tolerant and law becomes more permissive is certainly not going to happen. So I think reproductive autonomy is not a battle that is won. It's a fight that will undoubtedly continue um, beyond the end of my lifetime. So <laughs> I'll, I'll end there, Sarah. in some ways relying on 
I think something um, that legislates the name abortion lawful um, restricts states' rights, um, state capacity to, to interfere with that. I think that's by far the, the best option. Um, the, the, to be honest, I think one, one thing that's quite interesting here is, is just how pragmatic I think one needs to be in relation to this. I was, I was at a, an event at LSE last week about I think whatever it takes is fine by me. I mean, if it's if it's a if a court case is easier, then then so be it. But I do think it would be really good to enshrine it permanently um, in legislation. I think I think there will be pressure on the U.S. from the United Nations. There's already some suggestion that the U.S. has been breaching some of its international human rights organisations, and I think that could be quite helpful pressure as well. But but frankly, I'm a pragmatist. Here. Whatever it takes is um, is, is okay. she's okay with it, they can register the birth themselves, there is then no need to transfer parenthood because they don't need parents at the birth. So that's what they're suggesting, but we're yet to see the final recommendation. And of course, what the Law Commission suggests doesn't necessarily become law, um, because it then has to go through Parliament, and, and who knows at the moment, we are current um, House of Commons have no idea what, what, what the um, consensus would be in favour of liberal abortion reform, though I do know there are some vocal There's a sense in which 
has actually been relatively permissive and um, relatively easy to, um, to administer and to think to provide the treatment they need. So I think there is, there is some basis for that self-conducted regime. I think other countries have done this very differently um, and it, it does really vary. And some countries have very little regulation. Uh, the Ministry of Health, uh, there isn't the, the sort of resource that we've been talking about. It's much more of a free market in, in, um, in care. Um, and in some parts of Australia, there are more restrictive provisions. So there's been much more restrictive provisions that relate to surrogacy in parts of, in some parts of um, Australia. And in Europe, there's been, there's been huge variation um, in relation to the legality of different things like being transferred to international diagnosis and um, egg donation. There's been real variation across Europe. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think there's a country one could point to where we could say, well, that's the perfect model. Let's take that off the shelf. Um, I think the UK model's actually been OK, um, generally. But there's undoubtedly things we could learn from, from other countries about how to, to do things differently. I think one thing that we, that we, that we think quite a lot, and obviously the pandemic has, um, has an effect on this, is British patients going for treatment overseas. Um, and that's quite an, an interesting phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people see patients as cheaper, um, but sometimes people perceive the care to be better, and that's quite interesting as well. Sometimes people feel that the care is more cost intensive in some other countries. So I don't think um, I, th I don't think there's an easy answer to where to adopt this is best. But um, the UK, I think the UK framework is okay. I think if it was, I think there is some sense that it might be used. So there's some debate about how, how comprehensive that could be. And I think it could still be very challenging for British people to get. I think there's a whole lot of stuff that's in the, in the law which really doesn't need to be. Because in 1990, there just wasn't the good practice guidance that there is now. So the Act contains extra rules about confidentiality, about consent. And, and actually, doctors now know what they're doing with confidentiality and consent. They don't need this whole extra layer of so my, my own view would be we could strip the act now quite a lot and, um, and make it more of a skeletal framework that didn't contain so many, um, so many restrictions and so much paperwork. So for example, when people have to fill in for treatment, they often have to fill in lots and lots of different forms. And this is really confusing, but it also increases the chance of human error if there are quite a few cases where forms are still filled in wrongly. So simplification, I think, would be really good. Um, Wendy Bell. I think, in some ways, we should be a bit wary of, of, of deciding that IVF is a behavioural addiction. There's a, often a tendency to medicalise things and say this is a pathology and we need to, uh, we need to treat it. But I, I do think that, that um, clinics are, are much better at getting people through the doors and getting them to write checks. And people don't write checks anymore, but <laughs> bank transfers or whatever. Um, use their their um, touch card to, to pay money and are not so good at helping people to, to, to exit from, from treatment without a baby. So you go into an IVF clinic, they're full of pictures of babies, and for some people, for a lot of people, that's not what happens in the end for them. Um, but I think we're really bad at managing that experience for people and giving them information about, about, about stopping and, and the fact that you I think quite a lot, there's quite a lot of, Sarah's book is absolutely wonderful on this, about um, people feel that they just can't just say enough 
keep going and, and that their life is on, I mean, some sort of disability, but that their life is on hold. Well, I had an idea. That they couldn't, their life was on hold, but they couldn't get on with the life that they might have without children because they were stuck in this experience of, of having a cycle that doesn't work and there are disappointing results. You try again, it doesn't work, and it's really, really hard to get off that treadmill to sort of, as you say, it's not that you find them, Sarah found them. Do you see 
another role for the APCA in the future in that respect? And um, what would you like to see or would recommend? And is there any precedent for that in other regulators in the UK or elsewhere? And secondly, I was wondering um, about, in your book, Regulating Reproduction, you write about the uh, distinction between contraception and abortion. And uh, you call it the second problem. Um, in relation to mifepristone, uh, or IU uh, 466. Um, and there you mentioned the use of mifepristone at the end of menstruation, um, uh, so at least it's once a, a month, which could create some confusion about whether or not a very early abortion has taken place. I'm currently involved in a clinical trial that looks at using uh, a fourth of the dosage that you would use for an abortion um, on a weekly basis, which also protects the regulation. Um, and I was wondering, from a legal point of view, what would be your view, both in the UK and in the US context, whether um, the uses of mifepristone or the abortion pill in the context um, of contraception, um, whether that would lead to any difficulties of the abortion law spilling over into the contraceptive area, or whether it would be an effective way of dodging uh, the new uh, limitations on abortion. So, um on abortion, unfortunately, the Abortion Act in this country would um, would criminalise um, that the use of mifepristone um, or pills contraceptives in that way because it could be an early abortion. We think an early abortion it would be lawful only if you jump through the hoops in the Abortion Act, so you need the consent of your doctors and, and all sorts of other restrictions like that. Um, so I think it's it's the UK's. Dobbs is terrible, but the UK's abortion law is not great either. Mm. It's better than um, better than Dobbs, but it's it's still a problem because in England, um, Scotland, and Wales, abortion is still governed by the Essential Safe Person Act, so it's still a criminal offence to steal an embryo. Um, you could only have a defence for that if you satisfied the criteria in the Abortion Act, and one of those is two two doctors agreeing that the pregnant woman's um, life would be or well-being would be more at risk from um, the freedom of pregnancy from, from, from abortion. And obviously, it's not going to be that helpful for contraceptive purposes if you have to go and get two doctors to, to sign off on that. So I think there's a lot of reason to, to change um, the UK's abortion law, and that's one of them, yeah. because there are all sorts of developments in contraceptive technology which are potentially problematic legally in the UK, but which would be really, really sensible in terms of um, expanding women's options, and perhaps particularly for some women from vulnerable groups, would be really, really helpful. Um, and so I think we've got a Victorian abortion law, um, not slightly corrected by a 1960 statute that we're really, really looking at, and that's one of the key reasons why it's asked for people, that if it restricts options for women. I think I've forgotten your first question. Did you? Oh, about the HSCA and the, um, its role after the revision of the law in terms of Oh yeah, so um, I think one thing that the HSEA is saying that it wants in relation to a change in the law is a greater array of sanctions, which I think would be sensible because the HSEA sanctions are either a slight tap on the wrist or the nuclear option of shutting the clinic down. <laughs> now that's not very sensible because there needs to be some middle ground where you can say, actually this isn't okay, which isn't just you shouldn't do that again. Um, so I think, I think sanctions, for example, fines for clinics that are advertising things in a way they shouldn't be would be much more sensible because they're not going to shut a clinic down because it's put something in dark when it's led by by embryo D. Um, but on nonetheless, it, it sh there are, if it's saying dark things about embryo D, you probably need some mechanism to stop them from doing that. So I think that would help. Um, I think one of you could say H the HSEA should be given some control over prices, which it doesn't have. It's not a regulator that has control over what clinics actually charge. Um, and one of the reasons, I guess, for that was in um, 1990, it was assumed that quite a lot of this would be NHS. So there is, a, there was, if you read the 1990 state, there isn't, I mean, it's, some of it's obviously private, but there isn't some sense that this is going to be main, mainly in charge of the private sector. So I think, although I think it might be helpful for the HSEA to be able to have more teeth when it comes to what clinics charge, I, th I do think Loading up the HSEA with more powers is maybe not sensible, and what we need is a more streamlined 
very much, and I don't um, wish it spoken. Um, I guess I brought the info, a lawyer's question for a lawyer. Um, I wondered if, um, if you thought that tort law had stood up well for tort reporters or stories to be made to stop them. Did it stood up well enough to um, the errors that occur? Um, and I'm thinking of um, an academic work in the US where he's arguing for a, a new tort to try and largely rectify the problems with not having um, the sorts of damages recognized in the law of negligence. Um, so then basically burning and injury to yeah. not through some accident um, or a defect in the job of work in the way it should or like that Singaporean case yeah. where there's a mix up and the baby doesn't have uh, the genetic link to the parent or the um, negligent fault work or skin color as they call it here in the UK. How do you think we're going in this jurisdiction for those sorts of things? I think it's a really good question. Um, I think I think my, my answer is not not brilliantly, but also I think what would worry me is that there are all sorts of reasons why clinical negligence is a disaster. Um, so increasing the number of people who go down that route, I think, is not necessarily terribly helpful. And although it's, well, obviously we probably do need some mechanism to compensate people who feel that they've had some um, really negative experience during the surgery treatment. I'm not sure that making more people pursue actions in, um, in tort law through the courts is necessarily a good option. We really ought to be driving improvements in care so that poor care doesn't happen. And obviously lawyers don't get mistakes, but but the, I, I just think I'd be quite in favour of abolishing clinical negligence, which means that I'm not sure that opening it up with more with more actions here would be be a good idea. I think we have one more. Yeah, uh, I had a question about social policing. So in some countries, it is completely forbid forbidden. So you can only do act freezing if you uh, have some sort of undergoing cancer treatment, for example. Uh, what is the basis for that? Is that because it's like to prevent it from being commercialized, or what could potentially be the reason? Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure. It. I'm not sure what the reason would be. Uh, I, I guess it would be the idea that um, you don't want to um, expand the number of women doing this uh, for social reasons because you're worried that it may not be in their best interest. Because okay. <coughs> one of the things with egg freezing is that we just don't know yet how many women will return to use them. So for many women, it could be a colossal waste of time, money, um, etc. So I think until we've got better evidence of how useful it is, and at the moment the evidence just isn't there, maybe we have to, I, I don't know about why, why we can't be doing that, maybe there's time to check against that. But I think that seems to me to be quite aggressive because it is an option, and if women find it helpful, the idea that you prevent women from doing it, you'll just be driving women to go in against the risk. Thank you very, very much for that incredibly comprehensive discussion of the regulated reproduction and much, much more. Um, and we're very pleased to be able to invite everyone to join us for a reception afterwards and have some of the presentations from the Research and Sociology Research Group um, at the meet room. Um, it's Mr. Darling. Thank you.